Staph unconscious patients, increased uh, intracranial pressure, hypothermia, uh, patients with uh, CVA, stroke, aneurysm, dementia, hypothermia, Parkinsonism, multiple sclerosis, mustania gravis, and meningitis, guys. So we can start with which one? Unconscious patients. These are, are an, an arousable. Okay, it could be primitive or demonstrate no response to painful stimuli with altered respiration and decreased cranial nerve and reflex activity for that case, okay? So they experience diminished alertness, uh, decreased self-awareness, and impaired responsiveness to external stimuli. For such a patient as a nurse, you have to maintain a patent airway by positioning the patient appropriately and sanctioning secretions where possible if needed, right? You have to monitor for the vital signs regularly and especially respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and intervene promptly. You have to protect the patient from skin breakdown, right? Uh, this pressure injuries. Guys, a link on pressure injuries will be popping up. You can see how to grade them and how to manage the different uh, de uh, degrees, all right? Okay, guys, number two is increased ICP, increased intracranial pressure. Normally, uh, the normal pressure will range, intracranial pressure will range between 5 to 15 uh, millimeters of mercury. If you have a pressure greater than 20, this will need treatment. The earliest sign uh, for somebody with increased ICP is mental status change or altered a level of consciousness. And this could be caused by injury, to especially the head injury or trauma, uh, and then increase in CSF production, right? Or the encephalitis, or another cause could be hemorrhage, hematoma, tumor, hydrocephalus. All of them will lead to increased ICP. Remember, it's causing disturbance uh, within the three components, okay? the blood, brain, and the CSF, right? Okay, guys, uh, for your information, you just need to know that the main symptoms of uh, ICP, increased ICP, is actually a complete opposite of the symptoms in shock, right? Okay, so in shock, we, accept, we expect to have decreased BP, increased pulse and respiration as they try to compensate for that. But in ICP, we are having, we are going to have increased BP and reduced pulse and reduced respiration. What we commonly refer to as the Cushing triad, right? The Cushing triad for, for that case, okay? So the cause of this increased ICP can be explained using the Monroe Kelly hypothesis, where he says that if the volume of one of these structures, could it be the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, or the blood is affected, the others will have to decrease their volume to elevate the pressure, okay? So when there is an increase in ICP, the body can temporarily compensate it by shifting either CSF to other areas of the brain or spinal cord or altering blood flow going to the brain through vasoconstriction, okay? But if the pressure is continuous, this is an, it is unable now to compensate for such, okay, for that case. Remember daily, someone is able to produce around 600 mils of the CSF, okay, daily. And we had already said they are produced by the colored plexus, okay, starting from the lateral to the third to the fourth until they are reabsorbed at the subarachnoid space, okay? Okay, guys, that is so good of you guys. We can be able to uh, proceed uh, in for this one, okay? So here we also need to look at the CPP which is the um, cerebral, cerebral perfusion pressure. And the normal one normally ranges between 60 to 100 uh, millimeters of mercury. So when the CCF falls too low, the brain is not perfused properly, sometimes, so the brain cells will start to die, okay? So if a patient's mean arterial pressure starts to fall to the patient's ICP, then cerebral perfusion pressure will drop. So therefore, maintaining a sufficient map is essential. So one needs to know how to get the map, of which the map, uh, of which the, the map now, we, of course, we take the map, we take the diastolic, uh, you add it to twice the systolic uh, 
systolic uh, the, 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 the systolic added to twice diastolic then divide everything by three okay but our focus here is CPP cerebral perfusion pressure you normally get it by taking map you subtract the ICP so if you need if you know the following like for example if a patient has a BP of 90-42 and ICP 19 what will be the cerebral perfusion pressure first of all we calculate map so map we take um, twice the diastolic so it is 2 times 42 plus 90 okay divide everything by 2 okay divide everything by 2 by 3 I mean you get 58 okay 42 times 2 get 84 84 add it to 90 90 is our systolic get 174 everything divided by 3 get my our map is 58 right our map is 58 and they had given us our ICP as 19 so to get CPP you simply take 58 minus 50, 19 you get 39 and this is very low remember the normal range should be between what 60 to 100 so this 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 means that there is impaired uh, brain perfusion for for that case okay so what normally causes increased icp within the skull we have already mentioned it could be an injury it could be due to increased cerebrospinal fluid it could be due to hemorrhage hematoma hydrocephalus tumor or encephalitis for for that case okay and what happens with this increased icp when you have increased icp you have said we have limited cerebral blood flow due to decreased cerebral perfusion from the building pressure in the brain so the brain cell uh, will be getting skewed and this leads to ischemia so all of these can lead to swelling and edema which can eventually if not treated lead to herniation or displacement of the brain and the displacement of the brain can compress important areas in the brain okay specifically the medulla and the vagus nerve so when CPP uh, cerebral perfusion pressure falls too low the body tries to increase systolic pressure in order to make more blood go to the brain and this uh, this makes things worse all right so during this time the arteries will start to dilate cause of the retention of the carbon four oxide and this causes more blood to flow to the brain and this will compress veins and limit blood to the heart so hence this will lead to swelling and even more icp because we have increased we have again destabilized the three components so here in this case blood is the cause again okay so as all this uh, progresses the patient's signs and symptoms will start to become worse Therefore, it is essential to know that the earliest signs and symptoms of increased ICP is mental status changes. Okay? All right. In terms of signs and symptoms, we could say a mind is crushed, and that's the mnemonic, where we have already talked and said that mental status changes is the earliest sign. Right? Remember, and this one is very common in exams. You have to know it. So the patient will appear restless, confused, uh, will have problems performing normal movements and responding to questions. The next one, we have irregular breathing. And why is irregular breathing coming up? Uh, we have slowdown of respiration, and which becomes irregular. We normally describe them as chain, uh, chain stocks. So the patient will hyperventilate, then have an apnea cyclic. And this is normally a late sign. Okay, nerve changes uh, to optic and oculomotor nerve, where a patient will present with double vision, swelling of the optic nerve. They have uh, they experience the papilledema, papillary changes that is decreased or in, uh, increased or an equal size, abnormal doll's eyes where we have this oculocephalic reflex. Uh, in unconscious patient, we could have open eyes and move the head from side to side, all right? So that's how they behave. And if eyes don't move in the opposite direction but stay fixed, uh, that means this will be a bad sign. It will indicate that there is brain stem damage, right? 
So we have the decelebrate and decorticate, right? All right. So decorticate, this is flexure positioning, right? Flexor positioning. On a GCS, we'll score this as three, but decelebrate will be scored less. That is two, okay? That is, that is two. So in decorticate, we are bringing upper extremities to the core of the body, to the middle of the body. So we have abduct, abduction and flexion, okay? Legs rotated internally, okay? And feet flexed. While on the other hand, now the, the celebrate, we have extension of the upper extremities from the body, okay? It's the worst of the two, right? If you look at that. Remember, all is in the celebrate and you just think of extension, all right? Extension for that case. We could also have reflexive positive Babisky uh, uh, re reflex or uh, unconscious, which is of course late. Our patient could present with uh, seizures, headache, uh, vomiting, deterioration in motor uh, function for, for that case. Okay, as soon as you have to focus on preventing further increase in ICP and monitoring, uh, of, of course, the, of, the, in, of the ICP if monitoring device is inserted. Remember to position your head of the bed uh, 30 to 40 degrees uh, as this will help blood return to the heart and will have proper alignment of the head. So no flexion of the neck uh, because if you flex, you're going to decrease the venous return. Or hips, if you do, it will increase intra-abdominal pressure and this again will interfere uh, with, with, with with the with the condition okay so watch moving around all right you have to move it around in the bed right next is the respiratory you prevent hypoxia and hyper hypercapnia so remember when blood oxygen uh, blood oxygen uh, levels drops or carbon dioxide increase vasodilation normally occurs and this increases uh, the intracranial pressure you also need to monitor the blood gases and the oxygen level, so you sang suctioning as needed only, no longer than 15 seconds, right? Because if you do that, you can also increase the ICP. Remember to hyperoxygenate before and after uh, suction, right? Motor uh, mechanical uh, ventilation. You have to keep the partial pressure of carbon dioxide uh, low. That is between 30 to 45. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, carbon dioxide is going to cause vasoconstriction and this vasoconstriction will help decrease ICP by decreasing blood flow, okay? So you keep the PEEP low and increase the intrathoracic pressure, right? Okay, keeping intrathoracic pressure, it means you are going to, um, you are going to cause impaired uh, venous uh, return to the upper body so at least it will be retained in the lower limbs okay we have elevated temperature you can prevent this you have to monitor the temperature if the patient is unconscious okay you can take uh, the best is to take tympanic temporal or rectal not orally or axillary for that case uh, because there is a risk of for hypothermia so patient may have damage to the hypothalamus infection, dehydration, so high temperature increases ICP and uh, cerebral blood flow and metabolic needs of the patients. So can you give antipyretics? You can also give antipyretics as per the order, remove extra blankets, decrease room temperature, cool baths, prevent shivering, right? Because if you shiver, this will increase uh, metabolic needs and consequently the ICP also will be increase okay remember to do the neuro checks and do the treatment with the barbiturates because the barbiturates normally help decrease brain metabolism and bp which in turn decreases icp and we can also do edema management okay dehydrating the brain it must be done carefully watching the blood pressure and the renal function we could use the manitol. It's a concentrated type of sugar and one of the diuretics. Guys, a link will be popping up on the different, five different types of diuretics. Okay? All right. So, hypothermia is the other disorder. 
and uh, you find that this is classified. So we, when the patient presents with a temperature of more than 40.0 degrees Celsius, okay, uh, it increases cerebral metabolism, hypothermia, and it also increases the risk of hypoxia. Causes could be infection, heat, stroke, exposure to high environmental uh, temperatures, dysfunction of the thermoregulatory center. So assessment, you have to do the temperature higher, uh, you, a patient will be presenting a temperature higher than 40.6 uh, degrees, uh, degrees uh, Celsius, or shivering, or nausea and vomiting. So as a nurse, you have to keep a patent airway, you have to initiate uh, scissor precautions and monitor input and output, assess the skin and mucus for signs of dehydration, monitor for lungs, sounds along with these dysrhythmias, uh, peripheral pulses for systemic blood flow, and also inducing pneumothermia with fluids, cold baths, fans, or high uh, hypothermia blanket. Okay? Okay, guys. The next condition is CVA. This is stroke, and this is a condition that develops when the blood rich oxygen cannot reach the brain cells. And it could be a blockage due to blockage or bleeding, and this causes the brain cells to die. So mostly we normally have two types of the CVA. It could be ischemic or hemorrhagic, all right? So ischemic is the most common one, and this is due to a blood clot within a blood vessels or stenosis of an artery that feeds the brain tissue. So this limits the blood that can reach the brain cells, and this type will be due to either embolism, uh, thrombosis, or that case. On the other hand, hemorrhagic normally occurs when there is bleeding in the brain due to a break in the blood vessels. Therefore, no blood vessels will perfuse, uh, no blood will perfuse to the brain cells. In addition, this can lead to excessive bleeding from leakage of the, the blood in the brain, and uh, cause could be a rupture of a brain aneurysm, uncontrolled hypertension, or an aging uh, population for that case, the old age, okay? The third one, which is a mini stroke, is what we refer to as the TIA, transient ischemic attack. It occurs where signs and symptoms of a stroke occur, but last only a few minutes or hours and then resolves. This could be a warning sign that an impending stroke may occur. So if, this, if it occurs, the patient needs to seek treatment for that case, okay, for the mean, mean stroke. So remember that brain cells are very sensitive, and within five minutes, these cells will start to, uh, to become damaged, and the damage can become irreversible. So we have to uh, act in the shortest time possible. So strokes, they tend to affect one side of the body, so you need to be familiar with the functions of the right and left, uh, left side of the brain, all right? Okay, uh, we, we, we have already looked at the cerebrum, and uh, again, we're going to remind ourselves of this part. Remember, a patient could either be having right-sided or left-sided uh, uh, challenges. And the right side of the brain is the creative side of the brain, while the left one is the logical, uh, the logical side of the brain. So the right side function includes things like attention, controlling our attention span, showing emotions, ability to solve everyday problems by making decisions and plans, and reasoning, uh, like understanding jokes, uh, reading in between the lines, right? So someone who does not able, who is not able to understand the jokes, okay, and reading between the two, just to know this is a joke, this is not, uh, could be having a problem with the right-sided brain. Okay, making judgment, music, memory, music, awareness, um, control of the left side of the body. And if the patient has a right side, side brain damage, what do you think will happen? The patient is going to have problems with left-sided weakness because right side controls the left side. The patient is going to have impaired creativity, music, confused, cannot recognize faces or persons, loss of depth perception, trouble staying on topic, 
uh, because of the attention span here, guys, can't see things on the left side. A right-sided uh, brain, they normally have le the left side neglect, okay? All right. So they tend to ignore the left side of the body. And this predisposes them to so many injuries, right? They can maintain proper grooming, emotionally not going to think things through, so very impulsive. They have a poor ability to make decisions and assessing special qualities. Uh, they also have uh, uh, denials about, they deny about their limitations. They are not aware of their limitations, okay? So not able to read nonverbal language, okay? And very, have very short attention span. On the left side, guys, left side functions are involved in uh, logical uh, things like speaking, writing, reading, uh, math skills, analyzing information, planning, okay? Planning for, for, for that case, okay? So if a patient has a left side brain, uh, how will they uh, appear? Remember, the left side control the left, the right uh, side, okay? So if you have a problem with the left uh, brain, Right, left side brain, you're going to present with right side epi, hemiplegia, right? And um, <clears throat> now these other functions can be affected, right? Like aphasia, we'll have trouble formulating words, okay? Problem, uh, problem with the Wernicke's area and, com uh, and comprehend comprehending them, okay? Compared to the Patients of the left with the left sided uh, left sided uh, problems, okay, left sided of left side of the brain, the the left one, the left sided um, the left the left side brain damage patients are aware of their limits, okay. The right are not aware, okay. They deny it, very impulsive. The left one they know. And this, first of all, has some disadvantage, guys. These patients tend to experience depression, anger, and frustrations about this, okay? They also have trouble understanding written text uh, because left side controls speaking, uh, uh, speaking, writing, and reading, right? So they can't write, so they have agraphia. They can't uh, calculate or they don't have the math skills. Their memory is intact, okay? So they have issues with seeing on the, on the right side, right? And they are aware of, of the same, okay? Okay, guys, so we can, we, we can have now the other parts of, of the two. In terms of risks, so we are saying that uh, these risk factors, they should be able to be divided into modifiable and non-modifiable. So modifiable, these are things a person can change. And non-modifiable are things a person can't change, okay? So we could use the stroke happen as a mnemonic to remind us all the risk factors, uh, starting with smoking, use of uh, blood thinners, the thrombolytics, the rhythm changes, AFib and flutter, oral contraceptive, uh, family history, excessive weight, senior citizen or age citizen, hypertension, atherosclerosis, physical inactivity. If you have a transient ischemic attack, you've had it, or elevated blood sugars and you're resuming the brain, this gives uh, places you at uh, increased risk for, for that, right? So in terms of signs and symptoms for stroke, it happens suddenly, so you need to act fast as the nurse to help save the brain. Remember, within how many minutes? Five minutes, okay? You call a, resp a rapid response, uh, especially if in your US, so that you can, so that you can re uh, receive appropriate treatment, right? All right. So the exact time the signs and symptoms appear, you have to note it down, and this is very important for stroke treatment, right? So we normally use uh, the act fast, right? The act fast, uh, Mnemonic. We have the National Stroke Association has recommended the use of this mnemonic because this will help us assess signs and symptoms uh, for quickly. So the patient can also have uh, the following as well. They could also present with bowel and uh, bladder uh, incontinence and retention, along with F of drool, drooling or an even smile, 
uh, arm numbness, weakness, drifting, that is raising. Uh, so the end, you, you need to tell the patient to try and raise both arms so we could, have, we could see drifting. Speech, they can't repeat a phrase or they could have a slurred speech. And time is very important for you to note at what time did the symptoms start appearing for that case, all right? So we could have a fascia because of shock. These are unable to speak, so they are not able to comprehend. So they are not producing it sometimes, okay? We could have receptive aphasia. This is receptive aphasia. They are not, they are unable to comprehend the speech. And this is a, could be a problem with the Wanikes area, all right? Or they are not able to, or for this second part, the patient is able to comprehend the speech, yes, but they can't respond back with correct words. So in this case, we say it is expressive aphasia, okay? Expressive aphasia. That is how our, someone has a problem with the broncus, with the broncus area, okay? We could also have mixed aphasia with this combination of the two. Our nickels and the broncus area all are damaged. Or the global aphasia, where there is complete inability to understand speech and produce it, okay? We also have another abnormality, the uh, dysatria. These are unable to hear speech clearly uh, due to weak muscles, okay? Hard to understand the patient's speech. And uh, the speech also may be slurred, right? So we are unable to hear the speech clearly due to weak muscles. Apraxia, they can perform voluntary movements like winking. They can't wink. They can move the arm to scratch an itch even uh, the muscle are functional. The function is normal, so they can't do it, right? Agraphia is lost of the ability to write for that case, okay? So this is a stroke uh, case. Alexia, this is loss of ability to read. They can't, they don't understand or they recognize the words. Agnosia, this is they don't understand sensation or recognize uh, non-objects or people, okay? Especially the right-sided, right? Right-sided uh, people, right-sided brain damage. Dysphagia, we have issues swallowing because of weak muscles or hemianopia, this is limited vision in half of the vision field, right? For that case. So next we have the hemiparesis. This is weakness of one side of the body, right? If you could be left side or right side, how it's diagnosed, we have the CT and the MRI, right, for, for that case. So medication for ischemic strokes, we could have a tissue plasminogen activator, especially for these ischemic strokes, uh, only, uh, only the not hemorrhagic, all right? So, so this tissue plasminogen activator normally dissolves the clot within the blood vessels by activating the protein that causes fibrolysis. And this drug, they, it must be given within three hours from the onset of stroke symptoms, okay? It can also be given three to four or four, four and a half hours after the onset if the criteria is met. So to receive this tissue plasminogen activator, the patient should have at least a CT scan of the head that is negative or hemorrhagic. The labs should be within the normal limits, especially the glucose, the ENR, and the platelets. Blood pressure needs to be controlled, so the systolic blood pressure needs to be below 185, while the diastolic should be below 110. Glucose should be controlled because it increases uh, risk for hemorrhage. And it should not be receiving heparin or any other coagulants for that case. Your role is to monitor for bleeding, neuro checks around the clock, uh, BP medication if needed for hypertension, right, for, for that case. Remember to turn every two hours with proper alignment and watch for increased ICP, okay? Okay, so in assessing the stroke, we normally, uh, we normally use the NHIS stroke scale where we have 11 assessments are scored, and the score ranges from 0 to 42. So 0, there is no stroke symptoms. But now for 21 to 42, this represents severe symptoms for that case. Okay? Intervention for aphasia, you have to make sure that communication is key, 
uh, you know, just because the patient can't communicate doesn't mean that they have a mental deficit. Okay, so get it. know how to communicate with your client. Okay, the problem in this case, they just can't get uh, out and uh, it just takes time for them to do it. Okay, so the nursing role is to try and help bridge the gap between and make it less frustrating for the patient. For the re recep re receptive aphasia, the ones with a problem in the one case area, okay, they can't comprehend. They can't comprehend. You have to use short phrases, use gestures or point while giving a command. <clears throat> and you must be patient not to expect a fast response and remove most of these distractions. For the expressive, the one that can comprehend but can't respond back, okay, those with the problems with the broker's area, you have to be patient with them and let them speak and be direct and simple when speaking uh, and asking questions and give them options. Is it A or B? All right, so that they can easily pick A or pick B, okay? Communication could be through via an eraser board, okay? So where you can be able to write and have it, okay? Okay, so this, uh, these patients may need thickened fluids and uh, mechanical soft foods and assist with eating and monitor for poaching of the food. Uh, you have, because, you know, the poaching will increase the risk for aspiration. So remember to ask the patient to tuck in the chin to their chest, especially when they are swallowing to reduce the, uh, the risk for uh, choking, right? Also about safety, all right? Especially those with right side brain damage. They tend to forget about the left side, okay? And this is a risk for injury because the patient ignores the affected side. Okay, so you have to remind the patient to use and touch both sides of the body, okay? Make sure they must make a conscious effort to do so, right? Educate the patient about the importance of turning the head side by side, side by side, to prevent injuring the, uh, the, the, other, the other parts, okay? Okay, guys. So we have next, we have the spinal cord injury, right? Spinal cord injury, so this can lead to loss of motor functions, sensation, reflex activity, bowel, and complication. You have respiratory failure, autonomic dysreflexia, spinal shock, and uh, further cord damage and death. Uh, commonly, you have affection, uh, affected parts could be the cervical part, the lumbar, thoracic, and we have the spinal uh, cord injury or the autonomic uh, dysreflexia. So you have to assess the respiratory status, uh, look at the sensory and motor paralysis below the injury, uh, and, and look for um, reflexes. Okay, we could have low of reflexes, loss of blood and control, presence of sweat, and this is not on the paralyzed areas. Tetraplegia, paraplegia, for that case, okay? So we have cervical injuries, that is C1 to C2, they are fatal. C4 is a major innovation to the brain, to the diaphragm, so it controls breathing for that case. And the C5 to C8 may, invo may involve the shoulders and decrease the respiratory reserve. Thoracic level injuries, we have loss of movement of the chest, the, the, the trunk, the, the bowel, the bladder, the legs, we could have leg paralysis may occur. Autonomic, autonomic dysreflexia could be injuries above the T6. Right. Lumbar and sacral region, we could have uh, absent lump, motor and sensory of lump of lower extremities. S1 to S3, we could have, patient could have neurological bladder problems. Above S2, we could have um, and the patient could have could be unable to ejaculate, while S2 to S4 we could have <clears throat> problem with erections and ejaculation. So you have to always suspect spinal cord injury when trauma occurs until this one is ruled out for that case. So here you need to assess the respiratory pattern, prevent head flexion, rotation, and extension, maintain body in extended position, and in case of movement, you look roll the patient, 
right? So no part of the body should be twisted or turned. Not allowed to sit, all right, uh, for this patient. Cervical fracture in the ED should be placed immediately in the skeletal, in the skeletal fracture, right? Okay. So for the respiratory, you could assess respiratory, uh, especially for C4 injuries, right? And monitor APGs maintain uh, mechanical ventilation, deep breathing or incentive spirometry, and uh, you ruled out signs of infection like the new pneumonia. Okay, so in this case, you are going to use the incentive res, um, spirometry, right? Spirometry. This will help people to take slow. Uh, deep breaths and it's like an exercise equipment for the lungs just to keep them strong and working well For the cardiovascular you could perform the Hohmann sign Okay, the calf pain at the dorsoflexion of the knee of the foot So it is thought to be associated with the presence of thrombosis for that case for the neurological system you assess the neural status and uh, you immobilize the gland and also assess pain, initiate measures, and monitor complication of immobility for that case. For the gastrointestinal system, you assess uh, the uh, distension and hemorrhage and monitor bowel sounds and paralytic ileus, prevent bowel retention and bowel control programs, and have adequate nutrition and high fiber diet for that case. So we have the spinal shock injury, all right? The spinal shock injury for that case. So we have the spinal shock and a neurologic shock. You need to be able to distinguish between the two. So for the spinal one, uh, this is temporal loss of motor, sensory reflex, and autonomic function. Okay, so mostly immediate, and uh, it only lasts for uh, less than 48 hours and it could continue for several weeks characterized by several signs and symptoms if you try to compare it with neurologic uh, neurologic is sudden loss of sympathetic nervous uh, system signals so in terms of sim symptomatology spinal uh, shock will present with hypotension uh, of course both of them will present with hypotension uh, bradycardia and um, the flaccid uh, paralysis will more uh, uh, vivid in uh, the spinal, the spinal, and of course the time is almost the same, right? Mechanism is one that has some uh, differences. Uh, uh, spinal shock uh, is caused by the peripheral neurons becoming temporary and responsive to brain stimuli, while uh, neurologic we have disruption of autonomic pathways. Okay, so there is loss of sympathetic tone and vasodilation for that case. Okay, okay, guys, we can uh, we can have we can have the uh, the neurologic. Of course, the neurologic is there's the injuries above the T the T six, right? T the T six. Autonomic uh, dysreflexia, aka the autonomic hyperreflexia, it occurs after the preload of the spinal shock is resolved. And this could be involved injuries above T6 and the cervical uh, region for that case. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the next one is the Parkinson disease, and this is because of, uh, it's caused by loss of dopamine. Uh, so you have more acetylcholine leading to overstimulation, patient presenting with tremors, rigidity, and bradykinesia. It frequently occurs in a population of uh, the older population, elderly, that's above 60, uh, and, and there is no cure for this kind of disorders. So patient will have tremors at rest, which is the most common symptom associated with uh, with uh, this uh, disease all right okay it can also come out as a result of um, use of neuroleptics okay the antipsychotics okay patient could present uh, with uh, parkinsonism uh, symptoms the treatment is use the cavidopa the lepidopa we re commonly refer to as the cinemat okay it takes up to three weeks to for you to notice uh, improvement in symptoms.
okay, for that case. And when you're using this drug, body fluids normally turn dark, so patients have to be made aware of, of this, okay. You, when you're also taking these drugs, you don't need to take them with the AMOA, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, because this could precipitate a, a, a hypertensive crisis. In addition, you need to avoid uh, uh, foods um, that are rich in, uh, in these carbohy carbohydrates, right? Um, so, and, and those that are rich in tyramine, right? Those risks that are rich in tyramine, this could still pre uh, precipitate hypertensive, uh, hypertensive uh, crisis, okay? Okay, so the next is Alzheimer's disease. This is the most common type of dementia. Guys, a link will be popping up on the differences between dementia and delirium for that case. So for the dementia, it's a progressive disease that begins with mild memory loss and then possibly leading to loss of ability to car uh, carry on a conversation and even respond to the environment. Next, we have seizures and um Scissors, they occur when abnormal electrical signals are being rapidly fired for the neurons in the brain. Uh, with from uh, the, It could be caused by different uh, conditions, but we have types. We have generalized uh, scissors and focal scissors. So generalized scissors, they do affect uh, both parts of the brain. And under this, you have tonic uh, clonic, which were formerly known as the grandma and the absent scissors, formerly referred to as the petite mal, and then atonic and the myoclonic. The focal one, uh, also referred to as partial, and uh, in this case, we could have um, simple partial, right, and uh, complex partial for that case. So the tonic, they were uh, formerly referred to as the grand mal, and we have them, right, so if then you have the tonic phase, this then the tonic phase is characterized by jerking, all right? So usually the 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 scissors should not last more than three minutes because if they do, then there is a risk for status epilepticus, especially if it's greater than five minutes, right? So this needs to activate the emergency response team, right? So in short, we are saying that we have uh, stages of the, 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 the seizures, of which we have the, now the clonic, and then we have the post, the ictus and the post ictus, okay, which could take some hours to even days. Absent seizures, these are also petite, uh, petite mal, and the atonic, uh, these are means without uh, muscular tone in that case. Myoclinic, they are very short, take few seconds. Focal scissors, they're also called partial. We could have a focal ons onset aware, that these are simple, and uh, we have um, complex, okay? It keeps on alternating in awareness and has some motor uh, symptoms, okay? And temporal lobe is the most commonly involved for, for, for this case, okay? So we have scissor stages, and we refer them as the pipettes, uh, we start with the prodromal phase, aural phase, ictus, and post ictus, right? Remember, you have to make the timing because greater than five, this will be status epilepticus, and that should be uh, noted, and an uh, emergency team should be uh, <coughs> involved. There's a link will be popping up on the different stages of Caesar. You can review it your 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 free time. In terms of intervention, you should have a bed, uh, at bedside, you should have a suction and a, an oxygen ready, IV access, padded side rails, pillow under the head to protect the head, and bed in the lowest position, and also remove objects that could cause an injury to that case. Okay? So what are you supposed to do when your patient has a seizure? You gently lie the patient down and turn them to their side, right? And uh, you should not try to restrain the patient or try to hold the patient down. Just to protect their head and extremities, do not put anything in their mouth, remove anything that can impede their breathing or break, and then note the time it started. Okay, this is very important, all right, for our case, right? We have the post it cast, and then you have the triggers for, for it. In terms of treatment, we could use barbiturates, 
okay, the beach reds. We could also use the hydantoins, like phenytoin. It's normally used for the tonic, clonic, or the focal scissors. The only challenges that normally comes with it, it normally leads to gingival hyperplasia and also bone marrow suppression. So you need to watch out for platelets and white blood cells, and you also need to ensure that the patient is um, uh, carrying out uh, proper oral hygiene for that case, okay? Also teach about the rash that's associated with the Steven Johnson syndrome. So this one they have to report immediately. And you also need to ensure that you don't give this drug with antacids because they normally interfere with the absorption and drug uh, monitor their, their drug levels, right? Okay, for that case. So we could also have benzodiazepine, um, valproic acid, uh, and so many others. You also have the ketogenic uh, diet, okay, where we have 50% carbs, 30 protein, and 65% uh, fat. Cerebral aneurysm is the next one uh, for, the, for this case. So you avoid taking temperature via rectums. This is the major uh, nursing responsibility. Trigeminal analgia is all uh, neuralgia. It's also referred to as the tic dulorex. It's the chronic pain shoulder. It affects trigeminal nerve or the fifth cranial nerve. Okay, this provides feeling and the nerve signaling to parts of the head and heart. So have the Bell's pulse. This is caused by a lower motor neuron lesion of the the, the seventh uh, nerve, the facial nerve right uh, for that case we have the amylotrophic lateral uh, sclerosis this is progressive degenerative disease of the motor system and it's related to excessive glutamate or neurotransmitters right encephalitis uh, this is brain parenchyma infections and uh, it's often the meninges that has been affected transmission could be the air viruses the enteroviruses or even the herpes simplex type 1 uh, virus. West Nile virus, it affects the CNS and is caused by the mosquito bite and, uh, for, for, for that case, okay? Mostly, uh, you find that um, infected bird, the infected bird and you have the, infect, the, the mosquito, so they do until at least human is able to be uh, infected by the same. Gulenbach syndrome and multiple sclerosis. We say that uh, Gulenbach syndrome uh, will be affecting the peripheral nervous system, while multiple sclerosis will be affecting the central nervous system. All of them, they interfere with the nerves insulation, okay? The myelin sheet, right? The myelin sheet is destroyed in both cases, right? So that we have Gulenbach for the peripheral and the multiple sclerosis for the uh, central, right? So for the Gulenbach syndrome, we have gradual blocking of sensation, right? So and the most common type, we have the acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, okay? And the most common type in U.S., and it starts with paralysis or weakness and tingling sensation in the lower extremities. And then you'll migrate upward over time, right? So it's characterized by gradual blocking of sensation. Another type, we have the Miller-Fisher syndrome, uh, syndrome, and this one usually uh, affects the eyes for our case, right? Okay, so that is for the peripheral nervous uh, stimulation. And uh, we could, uh, we could uh, diagnose it using the LAMPA, where you have elevated protein without elevated uh, white, white BCs, okay? Okay, next we have the... Of course, the nursing intervention for the GBS, Cullen Bar Syndrome, you have to manage the airway uh, with the mechanical ventilation because of this uh, ascending weakness of the muscles. Uh, even those that control breathing will be affected for that case. Multiple sclerosis, this is uh, having the same, same uh, reflection with the GBS. GBS affects the peripheral myelin, uh, myelin sheath. Uh, multiple sclerosis will be affecting the central one, okay, the central. Guys, a link on, will be popping up on the multiple sclerosis. You can review the different types, of, of course. But we need to know that it majorly affects women, and the age category that is more affected is between the 20s to 40s, right? The major form of multiple sclerosis that keep, that is very common is the relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, all right? 
uh, that is the most uh, common one. We could also do the lumbar puncture here and you assess the spinal fluid for specific proteins which are referred to as the oligoclonal bands which are immunoglobulins for, for that case. Okay, uh, I think that one uh, should be, at least we should be having it for that. In terms of medication, we have a um, uh, difference in terms of the drugs that we use. We could use anticholinergics, okay, like oxybutrin, which helps in overreactive bladder. It relaxes the bladder to prevent contractions. And now we have the pethanicol, and this is also, uh, this is a, a cholinergic now, right? That will help to completely empty the bladder by helping the bladder contract fully. So we have to get that difference. After looking at uh, multiple sclerosis, we have other conditions like Mustenia gravis. And this is an autoimmune condition where the body attacks receptors that allow for voluntary muscle control, which leads to muscle weakness. So what voluntary muscles are, are, are involved? You could have the eyes, the throat, okay, the arms, the legs, right? So in Mustenia gravis, you find that nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are being attacked by antibodies in the, in the, in the immune system uh, that has created, and therefore they are not working properly, right? So these receptors cannot access the release of acetylcholine and cause muscle contraction. So there is muscle weakness, right? Muscle weakness uh, for that. The hallmark sign is muscle weakness becomes worse with activity, right? Uh, especially repetitive activity, but will improve after resting uh, the, the, that muscle, okay? Okay, we could also have symptoms like appearance like with mask-like, so no expression, looks very sleepy. Keeps choking uh, or gagging when eating this because they're having difficulty in swallowing. Remember, muscles that help in swallowing have become weaker. So there's no energy. They are very fatigued. They get uh, worse throughout the day as muscles are being used. They could also present with slurred speech where the voice may be hoarse and very uh, soft, right? Uh, they could also have short of breath and this can extend to expiratory muscles, right? Extra, extra ocular muscles are involved, leading to double vision and even strabismus. Okay. They could complicate where we have a, a mustanic uh, crisis. Okay. So where a patient doesn't have the size of symptoms, but some patient can experience severe acute exacerbation of these conditions. Okay. So that they now start uh, suffering from mustanic crisis. So this is where the disease is becoming worse and the patient may need intubation and the mechanical ventilation so as to so as to breathe. How is it diagnosed? We normally use the tensilon test where we do the hydrophonium uh, test. So during this test, we you normally use an anticholinesterase medication uh, is given, which is normally referred to as the hydrophonium. So this drug will prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And so if that is happens, it will allow more of the neurotransmitter to be present at the neuromuscular junction. So it's used to diagnose mustenia gravis and try and differentiate it between mustenic crisis and cholinergic crisis. So what happens uh, if you're given to mustenia gravis patient, all right, or mustenic uh, crisis. Uh, you find that the symptoms will improve temporarily. So this means that the test will be positive. But what will happen if you give this hydrophonium to a patient with a cholinergic crisis? It means that the patient's symptoms will become worse. There will be no improvement, hence the test will be negative for that case. So if this happens, the nurse will have to administer an antidote of hydrophonium, which is normally atropine, and also, it's important to have the patient on cardiac monitor during the test uh, for, so that you can be able to assess the patient uh, and ensure their safety, right? Okay, guys, so those are the different uh, uh, aspects of the mustenia gravis. So in terms of treatment, you can just give them the anticholinesterase. So we refer to this as the pure stigin, which try to improve the symptoms, okay? Remember, there is no cure. So this drug will work by preventing uh, 
acetylcholinesterase from working. So therefore, it will not break down acetylcholine. So more of it will be available at the neuromuscular junction and this will help improve muscle strength. So patients will take 30 to 60 minutes before a meal just to help decrease muscle, uh, to help increase muscle strength and uh, with swallowing and, uh, and, 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 and chewing, all right? Okay. Uh, final uh, condition is the meningitis. And uh, meningitis is the inflammation of the arachnoid and the pia matter of the brain and the spinal cord. And it's caused by bacteria or viral organisms. Although fungal and also protozoan meningitis can also occur, right? That case. Predisposing factors include uh, the skull fractures, the brain, spinal surgery, uh, sinus or uh, the upper respiratory infection, the use of nasal sprays and a compromised immune system will predispose you to this meningitis. So we normally have cerebrospinal fluid uh, being analyzed to determine the diagnosis and the type of many meningitis. So in meningitis, you find the CSF will be cloudy with the increased protein, increased white bases and decreased glucose counts. Transmission, uh, meningitis, is, uh, major transmission will occur in areas of high population density, crowded areas such as the college dormitories, and the transmission of meningitis is like by direct contact, okay? Okay, guys, that wraps the end of our presentation on neurological disorders. Guys, you could look at the access quiz uh, in the description section where you can be able to test your knowledge and cement uh, the different aspects that you have captured.